Hello everyone and welcome to Radcliffe Chambers Junior Programme today. My name is Poppy Birmingham Pounder and I am a junior tenant at Radcliffe Chambers. Uh, I'm joined today by James Fagan, who is another junior tenant at Radcliffe. James is going to be speaking first and he's going to be discussing uh, recent case law developments in the law of misrepresentation. I'm then going to be speaking and I'll be discussing parent company liability for the acts of their subsidiaries. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to James. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. And welcome to this junior program presentation on uh, re misrepresentation, recent developments in banking litigation. Um, I'll be looking at three cases today, uh, Leeds County Council and Barclays Bank, ABN AMRO Bank and Royal Sun and Royal and Sun Alliance Insurance, and PCP Capital Partners LLP and Barclays Bank. Uh, these are all recent cases involving banks, although only two of them, the Barclays cases, are banking litigation cases in the true sense, the ABN AMRO case being concerned with insurance. Uh, this talk is not intended as a microscopic examination of every point in these cases. Uh, the ABN AMRO case and the PCP case are in excess of 200 pages each, so that would be particularly painful for you and I think for me. So instead I'll focus on what these cases have to say about misrepresentation. Uh, misrepresentation can occur in a huge range of factual circumstances of varying complexity. Uh, however, the basic elements of a claim, uh, particularly in fraudulent misrepresentation, can be fairly simply stated. Uh, there are four main ingredients, that the defendant makes a false representation to the claimant, the defendant knows that the representation is false, alternatively he is reckless as to whether it's true or false, uh, the defendant intends that the claimant should act in reliance on it, and the claimant does act in reliance on the representation and in consequence suffers loss. And of course, uh, misrepresentations can be expressed or implied and they can be made by words or by conduct. So turning uh, to today's cases, what they're really going to be focusing on is the last of, that, in, of those ingredients, uh, namely the issue of reliance or inducement and, and the issue of calculation of loss, uh, in particular loss of chance cases. So the Leeds City case, uh, this was a combined case brought by Leeds City Council uh, and other city councils and the London Borough of Newham against Barclays for fraudulent misrepresentation arising out of the 2012 London Interbank offered rate LIBOR scandal. Barclays had applied to the High Court to strike out the actions of the local authorities uh, who were claiming that they were entitled to rescission of certain loan contracts that they had entered into between 2006 and 2008 uh, for terms between 60 and 70 years. Various aspects of the loans had been set in accordance with LIBOR, uh, which was a set of benchmark rates reflecting the rate at which banks uh, could obtain unsecured loans from other banks. What happened in 2012 was that the rigging scandal broke when it was reported that the panel of banks, which included Barclays, who set LIBOR, were manipulating the benchmark to give a higher or lower value than otherwise warranted. The local authorities claimed that the loans were tainted by a number of alleged implied representations concerning LIBOR that Barclays was said to have made by offering the loans to them. In essence, the representations were that LIBOR was being set honestly and properly, and Barclays was not and had no intention of engaging in any improper conduct uh, in connection with its participation in the LIBOR panel. Uh, contrary to that represented state of affairs, Barclays had manipulated LIBOR, which rendered those representations false. So what were the arguments that were being made for the purposes of the strikeout application? What Barclays contended was that the claimant local authorities could not establish that they actively or consciously appreciated that the representations they said were false were actually being made to them at the time. This is what Mrs. Justice Cockerell named the reliance issue. Barclays argued that a necessary element of the reliance portion of the misrepresentation cause of action uh, is that there is an awareness of the representation being made uh, and that none of the claimants, in fact, in their pleaded cases, alleged any such awareness. In contrast, the claimant's overarching proposition was that if Barclays' approach was correct, this would require the recipient of a misrepresentation at the time of contracting to have consciously asked 
is a representative making an implied representation to me? And if so, uh, what are its terms? And if not, they could never establish uh, reliance. And what the claimant said this amounted to was a rogue's charter. Central to the claimant's case was the proposition that awareness could not be forensically separated from inducement uh, and is not an independent precondition that has to be satisfied at its own merits before looking at inducement. It's important to note in this case that because the claimants did not plead they had a conscious awareness of the LIBOR representation, uh, it meant that if the bank, if Barclays was correct in their case, the claimant's case would be struck out. Uh, Mrs. Justice Cockerell found for Barclays uh, with the consequence that the local authorities' cases were struck out. What Ms. Justice Cockrell noted was that there is a body of case law which provides powerful support for the argument that proof of understanding of the representation is a constituent part of, the, of, of any case in misrepresentation. Uh, there is a distinction which marks a critical boundary between a claim for misrepresentation, which is generally actionable, and non-disclosure, which is actionable only in situations of utmost good faith or where the contract specifically provides for uh, a requirement of disclosure. And that awareness helps mark the boundary between uh, those two types of cases or causes of action. The claimants contended that an assumption, so an assumption that the counterparty is acting honestly can in certain circumstances be sufficient for the purpose of satisfying the reliance element. However, Mrs. Just Cockrell disagreed and came to the conclusion that there is a requirement of awareness. An initial review of the authorities indicated that there was no scope for reliance on an assumption alone where there is an issue as to whether the representation was ever actively present in the representee's mind. Going on to look at specific LIBOR and URIBOR cases, uh, Justice Cockrell solidified her conclusion that for a representation to be actionable, the representee must be aware of it. Uh, they must understand it in the sense in which they later complain about it. It, it must be actively present in their mind. What occurred in those other LIBOR and URIBOR cases uh, was the judges holding that the absence of any thought being given to the representations which were being pleaded uh, was fatal to any claim in misrepresentation. What the emphasis Justice Cockerell placed uh, on, on the reliance element of misrepresentation is that it establishes the causal link between the conduct of the defendant and the conduct of the claimant. It's therefore a question of fact. Depending on the facts of the case, it may or may not be necessary to break that building block down into its smaller parts, such as awareness. But that does not mean that the expression of the workings of the reliance element becomes an essential component of determining whether there's an inducement in a given case. However, in certain cases, they will become an important aspect of the litigation and the focus of the judge's analysis. Uh, in particular, it seems that in these cases where an implied representation is said to have occurred, the judges are going to be more likely to focus on whether there was any awareness of that representation at the time of contracting. The difficulty the claimants had was that even if Barclays had made those representations, they had no awareness of them at the time they were being made. Uh, their cases were simply predicated on this assumption that the state of affairs, namely that LIBOR was going to be set properly and, uh, and fairly and Barclays was not engaging in any manipulation of it, just simply didn't, didn't suffice. Uh, as Justice Cockrell explained, the nature of the facts was some way distant from the representations which are ultimately spelled out. The conduct does not speak for itself in the same way so as to permit a quasi-automatic understanding, which may look like an assumption. So what's going to be the difficulty for claimants in cases uh, where they're pleading implied representations is that when you look at the underlying facts, so in this case, the entry into a loan using industry standard method of setting interest rates is quite different from the implied representations that are going to be articulated in the claim. Uh, and that there was no general representation as to how that part of the transaction was actually being set by Barclays at the time uh, of the alleged underlying uh, facts. So this is not the same as a case where the conduct being complained of uh, 
clearly represents something to the other party, such as, say, a thumbs up to give approval. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, how does one draw a line between awareness and an assumption? And this is not necessarily an easy distinction to make, particularly given that this seems to be more important in cases of implied representation. And unfortunately, this case doesn't seem to lay down any general test. Uh, what Justice Cockrell said is that there will be cases where the element of awareness will come very close to something which might loosely be characterized as an assumption and which is most obviously derived from conduct, but that the dividing line between giving what's said to be contemporaneous conscious thought or an act of awareness to the conduct uh, and a contemporaneous conscious thought to the representation may be thin to non-existent. And the example given is where a bidder at an auction raises a panel because everyone will clearly know that that conduct represents a willingness to bid on, on the auction at, at the stated price. However, what this means for future cases where you're attempting to draw uh, some form of implied conduct in a regular contractual commercial situation is far from clear. And I think the takeaway for that from this is that implied representations can be difficult to make out. And unless the conduct is a sort that can give rise to a clear representation as to a state of affairs or knowledge, to belief or understanding, uh, there is a risk that a case based on an implied representation may begin to resemble one of an assumption as to a state of affairs or knowledge and be that much more difficult to make out. So we'll now turn to our second case today, uh, which is the banking litigation that's not really banking litigation, but insurance litigation where the bank is a claimant. Uh, this case involved ABN AMRO, who were claiming under an indemnity uh, of some £35 million pounds under an insurance policy uh, subscribed to by the first to the 14th defendants who were insurance underwriters. What had happened is that in 2016, the bank had entered into a series of repo financing deals with two of its customers, Transmar and Euromar, over cocoa and cocoa products. Uh, unfortunately, the, some senior executives in both Transmar and Euromar were convicted and imprisoned in the US for fraud. And following their defaults, the bank was left holding large quantities of cocoa worth only a fraction of the loan repayments that were due. So what the bank did uh, is it claimed an indemnity for the shortfall under an all risks policy of marine cargo insurance placed with the 14 cargo underwriters in the London market. And what was unusual was that the policy contained this strange clause called the transaction premium clause. And which what this did is it widened the cover to include risks that were not dependent on physical loss or damage to the cargo. Instead, it provided that the bank was covered for amounts that the insured would otherwise have received or earned in the absence of a default by its customer. What this essentially did was put the insurers on the hook for losses unconnected with the physical cargo itself. The defendants refused to pay and litigation ensued. And the defendants advanced a wide ranging defense that sought to avoid the policy. Uh, and the decision is notable for its guidance on numerous topics, including non-disclosure, construction of insurance contracts, affirmation, and the meaning of reasonable conduct in contractual provisions. However, what's relevant for our purposes today uh, is the aspect of the case related to misrepresentation uh, and specifically the judge's consideration of the inducement test. Three underwriters alleged a misrepresentation occurred during the renewal process of the policy uh, because of notes that existed on the files. Uh, and there were three notes that were relevant here. The first was that the policy was all as before. The second was that all rates, terms and conditions as expiry. And the third was that ex as expiry, but brokerage is up from 22 and a half percent. And the three insurance writers involved uh, were Navigators, ARC and Advent. So the first of these was Navigators. And what they said is that the representation that all else was before was a misrepresentation to them. And what Justice Jacobs held was that the statement in its context would have been reasonably understood to indicate that there were no material changes to the policy uh, as it was when before uh, navigators came to write the policy. 
so that it was the same as it was in 2015. However, there in fact had been material amendments, such as the inclusion of the transaction premium clause. So the question arose then was whether Navigators was induced to write the policy as a result of that misrepresentation. And I should point out at this point that this was a case of an express representation. So the first thing Justice Jacobs did is he considered uh, what the precise formulation for the test of inducement was. Uh, he said it involves asking whether the representee would have still contracted on the same terms if the representation had not been made. The question of whether the representee would still have contracted on the same terms is not the same as asking what the representee would have done if told the truth. The question of what they would have done if they were told the truth can only be relevant insofar as it bears on the critical question of would they still have contracted on the same terms if the misrepresentation had not been made. And that begs the question, well, what do we mean when we say, well, what constitutes being told the truth in these cases? And so Justice Jacobs uh, quoted the following extract of Justice Christopher Clark in the Refison case, which is that a relevant inquiry as to what the representative would have done is if he had been given sufficient information to correct the falsity of what had been said. Any other question would not relate to the falsity of the representation, but to what the representative would have done if he was given further information of uncertain extent beyond that necessary to ensure there was no representation. That would involve asking what the representative would have been done being given a representation different to the one he was actually being given. And so what we see is that the question here is actually a much more narrowly focused one. Uh, we're not saying, well, what if they would simply turned around and told you the complete opposite of what you say they told you? No, it's about what's the minimum amount of information that should have been provided to correct the misunderstanding or misrepresentation. And that may make a big difference in certain cases, because in some cases it may be a complete change in what you were told. In other cases, it may only be small amounts of information and then it's up to you to see what you would have done. And that being told the truth here is no more than is necessary to ensure they are not told an untruth. So what did this mean for the insurance underwriting? Well, unfortunately for navigators, uh, their case on misrepresentation failed. First, uh, this was a strange case where the court was able to see how 14 different insurance underwriters in the London market uh, would have rated and, and handled this risk. And he said it was far from obvious that the existence of this transaction premium clause would have made it that any underwriter would not have touched the policy and would have refused to have underwritten it. Second, there was nothing in the witness evidence that suggested that navigators would not have written the risk on the same terms if the representation had not been made. Instead, the problem with their witness their witness statements is that it was they were focused entirely on the issue of non-disclosure, and so they did not address how navigators would have acted if they had been told that the risk or policy had was different from what it was before. Uh, what Justice Jacobs said is that he could see in theory that an underwriter might say, if I had been told this, I would have made sure I reviewed the policy, asked what the changes have been, and unless satisfied with each and every change, I would not have written the policy. But that's not what Navigator's witness evidence said in this case. He simply didn't address what would have happened if they'd received the necessary information to correct the misrepresentation of as expiring. But this contrasts with Ark and Advent's case because their witness evidence was able to show an inducement and help them establish an estoppel in this case. Uh, what Justice Jacobs found is that if their witnesses have been told no more than was necessary to ensure there was no misrepresentation, then they would have been informed that there had been a number of changes to the policy. Uh, they would have then asked why the bank wanted that transaction premiums clause, and they would not have having received an explanation, would have declined to write the risk. So what we see coming from this ABN AMRO case is the importance of considering in detail the evidence that is to be provided in what is known as the counterfactual of what would the representee would have, they would have done had they actually known the truth, which is to say, had they had enough information to correct the misrepresentation being made to them. 
And so we now turn to our third case today, which is PCP Capital Partners and Barclays Bank. Uh, this was a claim by PCP for fraudulent misrepresentation, and it involved astronomical sums. The initial pleaded case was well over £1 billion. Uh, however, it was revised down to a not an insignificant £600 million. So the case is significant because uh, Justice Waxman held that Barclays Bank had indeed made fraudulent misrepresentations to the claimant, but the claimant's claim actually failed at the causation hurdle. There was no link between the misrepresentations and the loss that PCP alleged it had suffered. So the background to this case, like so many of the big banking cases over the past decade, is the 2008 financial crisis. A number of banks in 2008 were required to improve their tier one capital, uh, such as equity capital, to avoid a collapse of the banking system. And a number of banks received this capital in the form of government bailouts. However, Barclays did not wish to avail of government intervention because it feared an ensuing loss of autonomy and possibly of itself. So Barclays was in a stronger position than most other banks, and it could realistically raise the additional capital privately in the market. It had already raised £4.5 billion, uh, which included £2.5 billion from Qatar before the transactions in this case. It needed to raise a further £6.5 billion, uh, of which £3 billion was to be raised between October and December 2008. So its first set of investors was a Qatari state entity, Qatari Holding, and a Qatar company, Challenger, who agreed to invest £2.3 billion. Uh, the claimant, acting through a special purpose vehicle, agreed to invest three and a half billion pounds. Uh, there were some additional changes to the deal before completion on 27th of November 2008, but for the purposes of this overview, I'm not, I'm not going to get into them. PCP's case is that during the negotiations, uh, Barclays, through its senior staff, made representations to one of its partners, Ms. Rebecca Staveney. The first representation was that on Three occasions in October 2008, Barclays head of structured markets and its executive chairman of its Middle East business stated that PCP would get the same deal as Qatar in respect of the investment. Second, that when Ms. Stavely questioned a payment of 66 million pounds to Qatar, which had been described as an arrangement fee, she was told this related to the initial capital raise. And thirdly, uh, after the commencement of litigation, PCP became aware of some large loans that were made to Qatar, uh, and then alleged a separate and implied misrepresentation that Barclays had not lent to Qatar the sums required for its investment or sums otherwise to facilitate the investment. And so what then PCP said was that the same deal representation was false because Qatar had in fact received 280 million pounds and the 66 million pounds as disguised fees and that the loan was another benefit that formed part of the overall deal. And as far as the 66 million pounds was concerned, that was just simply false because it did not relate to the first capitalization. And in its case on loss, what PCP was alleging is that had the misrepresentations not been made, uh, PCP would have been in a stronger negotiating position. It would have been able to obtain an additional amount of value and additional levels of funding which enabled it to trigger certain remuneration provisions in heads of terms it would have negotiated. So in essence, PCP's claim was for a loss of chance to negotiate and achieve a greater amount of value in the investment and in remuneration for itself. As I said, the final claim was for £660 million. So it was quite a significant uh, a case. What Justice Waxman found was that the representations as to the same deal uh, representation and the arrangement fee were knowingly false. And so his judgment then turned to consider uh, the legal rules on loss of chance uh, and that the loss would be determined by reference to what would have happened had the misrepresentations not have been made. And that what you do in the case like this is you have to consider that uh, hypothetical counterfactual of what the claimant, the defendant, and certain third parties would have done in this alternative world where the misrepresentations uh, had been corrected, so to speak. The Allied Maples and Simmons and Simmons case is authority for the proposition that where causation depends on the actions of one or more 
third parties, the claimants must prove that there's a real or substantial chance of each third party taking that relevant action. In practice, a discount is applied to represent the uncertainty in that exercise. So by way of a simple example, if you were claiming that you would have received £100 from a third party, but for the defendant's misrepresentation, uh, and the judge assesses that you have a 70% chance of doing so, uh, you'll receive £70 in damages. Uh, and where this becomes useful to claimants is that the normal balance of probability rules don't apply. So if the percentage chance is less than 51%, you can still recover, although maybe a little bit less than you would have liked. Uh, so in that example I just gave, if the chance is 35%, uh, you would get a recovery of £35. Uh, whereas if it was to be determined on a balance of probability basis and there was a 35% chance, you'd receive nothing. So the first question that Justice Waxman had to consider was how do you apply loss of chance principles where some of the counterfactual points depend on the hypothetical actions of the defendant? Is the defendant a third party uh, so that we can apply those wonderful uh, loss of chance principles and get a recovery even if we think the defendant only had a 30% chance of doing something? Or do we take the all or nothing approach of balance of probabilities? What Justice Waxman concluded is that a defendant is not a third party for the purposes of determining what they would have done. And the balance of probabilities test applies. First, the only authority that expressly considered this was Heerenstein and Hill. And there, Justice Leggett said that where the question is what a party to the proceedings would have done, the matter is to be determined on the balance of probability. And that applies equally to the claimant and the defendant. Second, as a matter of principle, there's a difference where the counterfactual concerns what a defendant would have done, because that party is exposed to the full rigours of litigation and is likely to have provided full evidence on the counterfactual. And so it's not correct for a court to then disregard the evidence it has before it uh, if it thinks what would have happened is less likely to have occurred and therefore let the claimant succeed. And thirdly, the approach is supported by academic textbooks, including McGregor's on damages and Kramer's law of contract damages. Uh, Joseph Waxman also provided important guidance on when a loss of chance claim will not succeed. Uh, as you can recall, I said that you can succeed where there's a lower than 51% chance of success. But is there a level which the courts will consider is too low and decline to award damages? Uh, some textbooks had suggested that uh, each case turns on its own facts, and what is a negligible chance in one case will not be in another. So in a case where the chance is assessed at 10% in a £10,000 claim, uh, that may be negligible. But if the claim is worth £1 billion, that's a different matter because 10% of £1 billion is a significant amount. But Justice Waxman rejected that argument because while 10% of a high value claim is a significant figure, that has nothing to do with the assessment of the chance itself. The real and substantial threshold does not go to the ultimate outcome. It goes to the size of the chance, and that does not depend on anything else. And what Justice Wax would express the view is that 10% or less cannot be regarded as a real or substantial chance. There's a few other interesting points that can be picked up in the judgment. Uh, first, if, if there are multiple contingencies uh, so a sequence of independent events that need to be established, and all of them involve a loss of chance assessment, you should simply multiply the chances together to come to a final percentage. However, if the contingencies are not independent and are linked together, uh, that approach does not apply. Instead, instead, the failure of one part will have a knock-on effect and cause the other parts to fail. And where you have multiple outcomes, so for example, where you have a 40% chance of recovering X, a 20% chance of Y or a 40% chance of nothing, it's not fair to limit recovery by reference to that 40% chance of nothing. But how the court may deal with that will differ depending on the case. Uh, it has a number of options open to it. It may add them, it may blend them, for, by example, taking an average of the chances. So how did the judge deal with this? Um, on the balance of probabilities, only one scenario was open uh, that PCP would have obtained additional value in the deal. However, on the evidence before him, Justice Waxman concluded that there was no real and substantial chance of raising the amount of additional debt financing required and closing a £400 million funding gap to trigger the additional remuneration 
PCP said it would have received. And so therefore their claim failed. So what are the key takeaways from these decisions that you can take away with today? Well, firstly, in relation to assumptions, if you are considering a case of implied misrepresentation, you really need to drill down and determine whether there is going to be evidence that the implied representation had an active presence in your client's mind. Remember, when dealing with implied representations, what the client would have done if the representation was not made will not suffice for showing that they had an awareness. However, there may be a way of protecting yourself against this at an early stage when drafting contracts. It may be worth considering whether to include representations and warranties uh, that a benchmark or other contractual variable can be controlled by a counterparty. Uh, it can be set honestly or fairly or according to an objective framework. The goal is to try and create some form of hook for awareness as to the type of conduct that might ground an implied representation, for example, honest or fair behavior. In terms of inducement, you'd re-ensure that your witness evidence spells out exactly what your client would have done had the representation not been made, if it had enough information to correct the mistruth that had been told. Um, it's simply uh, not enough to say, I would, have, I would have done something else. You really need to think with your clients what their processes are uh, and what their approaches are to contracting and asking whether that would lead to the same result or a different one. And finally, if you're facing a loss of chance claim, uh, correctly identify who the actors are in the hypothetical because that will tell you whether you need to look at what the defendant's doing on the balance of probabilities or third parties on that percentage sliding scale. And finally, ask yourself, are these outcomes interlinked such that if one fails, they all fail? Or is it simply just a bunch of individual third party actions where you just have to prove each of them on that sliding scale? Uh, thank you very much. That's been misrepresentation and recent development in bank litigation. I'm going to hand back to Poppy now for her talk. Well, thanks, James, so much for that. Um, I'm now going to talk, as I said at the beginning, about parent company liability for the acts of their subsidiaries. Uh, and I'm going to look at uh, a few cases today, but the two key cases that I'm going to be addressing are the Supreme Court cases from the last two years of Vedanta Resources, PLC and Lungo, and Okparby and Royal Dutch Shell PLC. Uh, these um, cases have implications for litigators uh, bringing negligence claims and also implications for parent companies within a group company structure. So uh, in terms of um, why bring a claim against a parent company, I mean, what's the point in that? Well, there are a number of situations where it might be more beneficial to bring a claim against a parent company. Uh, one might be that the subsidiary doesn't have any funds. Uh, another might be that the subsidiary has been dissolved or has gone insolvent. Uh, and it also might be, and we will see this in a, a number of cases today, that um, where there's a multinational corporate structure, the subsidiary uh, is based in a foreign jurisdiction where there might be limited access to justice. And so it would be preferable to bring a claim uh, against the parent company that is domiciled, uh, domiciled and incorporated in a uh, jurisdiction such as England and Wales. Uh, so that would be why to bring a claim against a parent company. The next question is how? Well, we all know that uh, there's separate corporate legal identity uh, and piercing the corporate veil happens very, very rarely in the UK. Uh, and we know that in contract, this, uh, there's privity of contract, so you can't bring a claim against uh, a defendant if they were not a contracting party. So parent companies uh, can only be sued if they're a contracting party. Uh, coming to the position in tort, uh, this is slightly different. Uh, tortious causes of action such as negligence, deceit, lawful or unlawful means conspiracy offer slightly more flexibility. Uh, in the facts of the claim, there might be a contract underlying uh, the, the party's uh, dealings and arrangements, but not necessarily. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is negligence. This was um, one of the key causes of action in, in the cases of Vedanta and Okpabi. And I'm going to be looking at, as I said, the circumstances in which a parent company 
may be found uh, liable will owe a duty of care for the uh, acts of its subsidiaries. But first, uh, I'm going to look at a, a slightly older case called Chandler and Cape, a uh, court of appeal case. And in this case, the claimant uh, had been employed by a subsidiary company that was in the business of manufacturing incombustible asbestos. Uh, they have been employed back in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, about 50 years later, the claimant unfortunately discovered that he had contracted asbestosis but by that time, the subsidiary company who had employed him had been dissolved. Uh, and in any event, the subsidiary's employer's liability insurance did not cover those claims. So there would have been no point in applying to restore the company uh, and then sue under the insurance policy. What the claimant did instead was bring a claim against uh, the parent company. The Court of Appeal held in this case that a parent company in appropriate circumstances could be held liable for the health and safety of its subsidiary's employees. Uh, and in the same paragraph, uh, paragraph 80, set out the circumstances which, um, uh, when this duty was likely to arise. And I've, I've given those situations there, and you'll see from the types of situations set out that the focus um, is really on the extent to which the parent company is involved in the subsidiary's business um, and is aware of the subsidiary's business and system of work. The next case, uh, jumping forward a few years, that I'm going to look at is AAA and Unilever PLC. This was uh, an attempt to bring a claim by the employees and residents of a tea plantation in Kenya. Uh, they were trying to bring a claim for breach of duty of care, which they said was owed to them by the Kenyan company, uh, which operated the tea plantation, but also its English parent company. The claimants were, um, uh, their, their, their claim was premised on the basis that they had been victims of intertribal violence when the tea plantations were targeted during the 2007 presidential elections in Kenya. The Court of Appeal uh, followed the guidance in Chandler um, and uh, accepted that there could be a duty of care. And it also followed the Court of Appeal decision in, in Vedanta, which um, I'll come on to the Supreme Court case in, in a moment. But on the facts of this case, the Court of Appeal held that Unilever did not owe a duty of care. Uh, the Court of Appeal said that the claimants didn't have an arguable claim that the subsidiary had received the relevant advice um, in relation to political unrest and violence in Kenya uh, from the parent company. What the Court of Appeal also said, uh, and we see this later on in, in the later Supreme Court cases, um, is that the liability of parent companies is not a distinct category for liability and negligence. Um, as I said, it endorsed the guidance given in China and Cape. Uh, but what it also did was suggested two types of cases where uh, parent company liability is, is likely to arise. Uh, they said where the parent has in substance taken over the management, the relevant activity of the subsidiary, or where the parent has given relevant advice to the subsidiary about how it should manage the risk. Um, I flagged those, those two potential categories uh, because the Supreme Court later rejected this, uh, saying they did not want to shoehorn uh, the types of cases where a duty was likely to arise into uh, distinct categories. This brings us then to the Supreme Court case in Vedanta Resources and Lungo. Uh, this, uh, like the Unilever case, was a jurisdiction challenge um, and the appeal reached the Supreme Court. Uh, the claim was brought by Zambian citizens who claimed that their health and farming had been negatively affected by discharges of toxic matter into watercourses from the Changa copper mine. Uh, the claim was, uh, the cause of action was negligence and breach of statutory duties. Uh, Vedanta Resources was the ultimate parent company of a company called Concola Copper Mines PLC, and that company owned the mine. But Vedanta was incorporated and domiciled in the UK. The claimants had uh, attempted to bring the claim here um, because of what they said were access to justice issues in uh, Zambia. Uh, 
The appeal was ultimately um, dismissed um, um, for uh, so the jurisdiction challenge was refused. Uh, but the interesting part for our purposes of the judgment um, was is paragraphs 42 to 62, which is where the Supreme Court focuses on the issue of uh, liability of parent companies, for the acts of their subsidiaries. And what I'd say the key paragraph is paragraph 49 here, where the Supreme Court said um, about where a duty was likely to arise, that everything depends on the extent to which and the way in which the parent availed itself of the opportunity to take over, intervene in, control, supervise, or advise the management of the relevant operations, including land use, uh, of the subsidiary. Uh, what they also said, um, approving what was said in, in Unilever, was that the liability of parent companies for their subsidiaries is not a distinct category of liability in negligence. Um, but moving slightly away from the reasoning in AA and Unilever, they said that you shouldn't attempt to shoehorn cases into specific categories, such as those set out in Unilever, which I referred to. The Supreme Court also said there was nothing special or conclusive about the bare parent subsidiary relationship. Uh, and the, the guidelines given in Chandler and Cape, which I referred to earlier on, they said those are just examples of circumstances where the duty of care um, is likely to arise. So they're not prescriptive. Um, and they also said that the issue was likely to depend on a careful examination of materials produced only on disclosure and in particular upon documents held by the parent company. Now this is important because the cases uh, of Vedanta and also of Harvey, which we're about to move on to, uh, they're um, jurisdiction challenges. So uh, the, in, disclosure has not taken place yet. Um, and what the Supreme Court is saying is that actually this issue is likely to be decided after disclosure has taken place. So that brings us on to the Supreme Court case from earlier this year of Ockparby and Royal Dutch Shell. So again, this was an appeal from a jurisdiction challenge um, and it involved two claims that had been brought by Nigerian communities and they alleged that oil spills had caused widespread environmental damage caused by a pipeline operator um, and that was Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited. Now that company was a subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell PLC. And Royal Dutch Shell was the UK parent company of the multinational Shell group of companies. What the claimants were alleging in this case was that the parent company, Royal Dutch Shell, owed them a common law duty of care because it had exercised significant control over material aspects of the subsidiary's operations and or alternatively assumed responsibility for their operations. So the, in the High Court, uh, Mr Justice uh, Fraser held that it was not reasonably arguable that there was any duty of care upon the parent company, uh, Royal Dutch Shell. This uh, decision was then appealed, went to the Court of Appeal, and there the majority held that there was no arguable case that the parent company, Royal Dutch Shell, owed the appellants a common law duty of care to protect them against foreseeable harm caused by the operations of the subsidiary. However, uh, Lord Justice Sales dissented, uh, and in his judgment, he considered there was a good arguable case that the parent company did owe the appellants a duty of care. The Court of Appeal judgment was handed down on the 14th of February 2018. The, uh, subsequently, the Vedanta uh, Supreme Court judgment was handed down on the 10th of April 2019. Uh, and after that was handed down, um, Parby appealed and the Supreme Court gave their judgment in February of this year. The appellant's position was that the Court of Appeal had materially erred in law. Uh, and one of the uh, ways in which they said they'd erred in law is, was in the analysis of the procedure for determining the arguability of the claim at an interlocutory stage, as shown by the treatment of the th threshold for what constitutes an arguable case and by its approach to both contested factual issues and to the relevance and significance of likely future disclosure. 
Now, first and foremost, the Supreme Court held that the Court of Appeal had erred in law in this respect. Uh, they said that the Court of Appeal and also the High Court had conducted a mini trial, that the parties had swamped the court with evidence, did not update uh, pleadings in light of the evidence um, that they submitted, but the focus should be on the pleadings and whether they disclose an arguable claim. So that is a, a, a point to take note of for anyone who is uh, currently mounting a jurisdiction challenge. Uh, they also said that during the mini trial, conducting the mini trial, led to determinations being made on the factual evidence that should not have been made, and um, determinations uh, in relation to the documentary evidence that should not have been made. And this is Im important because, as I said in, in Vedanta, uh, it was said that the um, the disclosure of documents, particular documents that were held by the parent company, were likely to be relevant. And so here, the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal had discounted the, um, the prospect that further relevant evidence would be um, disclosed on disclosure. And that was at odds with Vedanta, admittedly hadn't been handed down yet, but also at odds with previous authorities um, that emphasised the importance of disclosure for determining this issue. The other um, uh, contentions of the appellants were that the Court of Appeal had erred in the analysis of the principles of parent company liability in its consideration of the factors and circumstances that might give rise to duty of care, and also the overall analytic framework for determining whether duty of care exists and its reliance on the Comparo threefold test. Now, the Supreme Court uh, also held that the Court of Appeal had erred in this respect, and this is what is of particular interest for us for purposes of today. Essentially, what the Supreme Court um, did was completely endorse Vedanta and say that that was the, the position um, of um, on liability of parent companies that acts their uh, subsidiaries and negligence. As they said, um, citing Vedanta, liability of parent companies is not of itself a distinct category of liability. Rather, whether a duty of care arises depends on the extent to which and the way in which the parent availed itself of the opportunity to take over, intervene in, control, supervise or advise the management of the relevant operations of the subsidiary. So that's that paragraph, uh, that excerpt from the paragraph 49 in Vedanta that I cited before. That is the sort of the touchstone for considering whether a duty of care has arisen. Um, and again, yes, they said there's no special test applicable to the torturous responsibility. Um, and it's not appropriate to shoehorn all cases of the parent's liability into specific categories, which is what was done in Unilever. So there's no test and there are no specific categories, but I would say that that paragraph 49, that excerpt there, is the sort of touchstone for when a duty of care is likely to arise. The Supreme Court uh, went on to address the Court of Appeals judgment um, and uh, again, citing Vedanta sort of showed how the Court of Appeal had erred in its approach. So there was some dicta from the Court of Appeal that suggested that the promulgation by a parent company of group-wide policies or standards could never in itself give rise to a duty of care. But the Supreme Court said that this is inconsistent with Vedanta and just not the case. The Court of Appeal also focused heavily on the issue of control, so how far the parent company was in control of the subsidiary. Uh, but the Supreme Court said that control is, is just the starting point. What, what's important is that um, uh, that's a touchstone, as I said, from uh, paragraph 49 of Vedanta, where it's um, how far is the parent sort of taking over or sharing in the management or giving advice. The, Supreme Court also said there's nothing special or conclusive either way about the bare parent subsidiary relationship. Um, so we've, we've already seen that, that that was said in Vedanta as well. And so just being a parent company doesn't mean that you're automatically going to owe a duty of care. But that also works the other way in that there's no presumption against you owing a duty of care because you are a parent company with separate corporate identity, which is what the Court of Appeal appeared to suggest. So there's no presumption created either way. Finally, the Supreme Court also said the Court of Appeal was wrong to analyse the case by reference to uh, Kapara and Dickman, because this wasn't a new or novel type of liability. The Supreme Court held there was a real issue to be tried, and in particular, um, they focused on 
the arguments by the appellants that the parent company had been taking over the management or joint management of the subsidiary and the parent company also promulgating group-wide safety and environmental policies and taking active steps to ensure their implementation by the subsidiary. Uh, the Supreme Court also referred to the group's vertical organisational structure um, and, and they talked about how the group was organised along business and functional lines rather than according to corporate status. Essentially what was happening was that decisions were, um, at least from the evidence uh, and the pleadings that were disclosed, decisions did seem to be taken on a, a corporate level, but that was after advice and consent um, from the vertical and business functional line. So the organizational authority would normally precede the corporate authority for decisions. So that was the judgment from Parby completely endorsing uh, the approach of the Supreme Court from Vedanta two years previously. Uh, and this is important because these Supreme Court cases have confirmed um, that there is a, a broad scope uh, potentially for claims to be brought against parent companies. Now, at the moment, we've seen that that's been accepted in relation to health and safety of the subsidiary's employees, so that's in China and Cape, uh, and also environmental claims. But there's no reason why this couldn't be expanded on um, to slightly different circumstances. As the Supreme Court said, they were unwilling to shoehorn uh, these types of cases into specific categories. So they've left it very open. The key, um, the key point, I think, for whether there's going to be a duty, uh, as I said, it, it, I refer back to that paragraph 49 in Vedanta, um, and where they said the existence of duty of care depends on, and I've um, reproduced that on, on the slide there. Um, and so that, I would say, while it's not necessarily a test, is a sort of touchstone that, that is useful. The relationship of the parent subsidiary um, is not in itself conclusive. It doesn't create a presumption either way. Um, also, direct or indirect ownership is, is not enough because what matters is, is how far they intervene in the subsidiaries um, business effectively and activities. Uh, we've also seen that it's highly fact sensitive. The Supreme Court in Parby in particular uh, ran through at length the, the evidence and, and the pleadings that have been put forward. Um, uh, but what will be important is internal corporate documents. And so I would say that really um, a proper view can only really be taken after disclosure because that's what we've really emphasized that it would be internal corporate documents that would probably decide the issue. So that's the significance for litigators and, and, uh, and those who are considering mounting um, a claim against parent companies for negligence. Mm -hmm. um, but what about parent entities, and those advising parent entities within group structures? Well, the, uh, the line of authorities we've looked at confirms that parent companies can be held liable for the acts of their subsidiaries. Um, and simply having a group structure with separate corporate personalities is not necessarily going to be enough to allow parent companies to avoid liability. Uh, the Supreme Court in Vedanta look, looked at um, the, the sort of uh, policies and sort of activities that might give rise to liability. Uh, what they said was group-wide policies can they, uh, they could be um, they could show that there was a, a duty of care because they might have, for example, systemic errors which, when implemented, will cause harm. Also, if parent companies take active steps to implement policies, such as through training or supervision and enforcement, then that could mean that they become liable. But I mean, even if a parent company doesn't do anything. Um, if they've held themselves out as having uh, a degree of supervision or control over their subsidiaries and published materials, this could be enough to make them liable, even if they don't actually um, if they don't actually have that level of supervision or control. Um, because as the Supreme Court said in Vedanta, its very omission may constitute the abdication of a responsibility which it has publicly undertaken. So in terms of where that leaves um, uh, parent companies in these group structures, um, they can be found liable. Um, one option for them to try and avoid that would be completely to abdicate responsibility. But of course, that may well be highly detrimental to the business because it's important to have good governance and appropriate policies in place, depending on the specific business that the group is engaged in. Um, of course, 
the best course is always going to be to have appropriate policies in place and ensure that they are implemented appropriately and attempt to anticipate and avoid any instance that could give rise to liability. And, um, uh, I'd just like to say uh, well, thank you to everyone who's attended today. We hope you found the talk to be useful, interesting. Thank you to Poppy for her talk. And our next junior programme is on Thursday, 13th of May, and it will be hosted by Natalie Pratt and myself on the theme of property law. So if any of you are interested in attending that, sign up can be found in the usual way on the Radcliffe Chambers website on the events page or through the usual social media channels such as LinkedIn closer to the time. Uh, but otherwise, thank you and have a lovely rest of your days. Thank you, everyone.